Good morning. We're gonna get started right away because we got 60 minutes, so it's like a marathon in a in a 2K. So we'll get started. This thing on, as they say. Okay, so right off the back, we're gonna do a little bit of Wizard of, Wizard of Oz, and we're gonna say, pay no attention to that camera person in the back. <laughs> <laughs> but we hope you're all camera ready, because guess what? Our session is being taped, so it will live on an infinitum. So there you go. Um, we're gonna jump right in. I'm Dr. Taylor. This is my colleague, Lindsay Meeker. This is the play-based uh, literacy. A lot of conversation going on about the comprehensive literacy plan that's out. That does include pre-K. So we decided last night, we have so much content, we're giving ourselves like 2.5 seconds per slide. So this is a little bit of information. About, I know like we're gonna talk fast, y'all just listen slow, okay? And we're here all day and repeating this again. So if you've got questions, we will be around to answer them. And then of course, there will be some more to come. Little bit of information about me. So happy to be here today. Feel free to just take a picture of that so that you can reach out to us. That's my website. Best way to reach me once you prove you're not a robot. Your questions or contact will come directly to me, not a secretary, anything right there. Comes directly to me, and then I'm going to hand it off to Lindsay. Again, we're going to talk fast. Y'all listen slow. <laughs> um, my email is not up there, but I'll put it up somewhere at the end of the day here. Um, and so this is a little bit about me. I would say that, again, um, Antoinette and I normally do this in like a full day or, or two days. So we'll just uh, um, do it right now. So what, what we would like you to do first is just take a minute to think about why we lean into play. Young children learn best through immersion in unself-conscious imitation of practical activities focusing on experiential education and imaginative play. And I really like this definition because we see a couple things in there that we, um, that we want to think about as we, as we move into this um, space of literacy and play together is practical activities, experience, and imaginative. Please take a minute on your own, and I'd like you to read this definition here and then Somewhere, I want you to jot down two words that stand out to you as key words in that definition. This is the definition from Teach Plus of play-based learning. Okay. At your table, just real quick, turn to your neighbor and share what stood out to you about this definition of play and play-based learning. And I want you to remember this for later because the good news is when the state of Illinois decided to design the literacy framework, they said, hey, early childhood is a big deal too. And they said, we have to do this in developmentally appropriate ways. And so I want you to take into, just put it in the side of your brain, guided play and student initiative play. Okay, that's going to be important to remember. And note, one-on-one, -on -one, small group, whole class. All right? There's things it is and things it is not. It's not a worksheet. If you're in this room, you already know that. Um, it's, a, but we do know it's a way to socially negotiate meaning. And we know that meaning making is part of the, I'm gonna say it, don't get scared, science of reading. Um, we know that it is an opportunity to propel literacy, language, and problem solving. It helps develop oracy which um, is part of that oral language component. Self-regulation, SEL competencies, all of those components. It is not something that you have to find on Pinterest and stay up all night to do. Okay? It is these things. 
inquiry is going to be more and more important. Early childhood, we know this. We read books about real things so kids can do real stuff. That's called interdisciplinary literacy. <laughs> you will see it in the literacy framework. We know that kids need to have autonomy and a gradual release of experience within their learning. We know it should be exploratory. We know for multilingual learners and really every other human ever, when it's connected to content, it has bigger impact. We know that we have teacher-directed play we also have student-initiated play, which we want more of all the time. And we know that it's a tool within the classroom. And I'm going to shock you, and you're going to hear more later. Play is a tool for MTSS. How do we use it that way? So I get this question all the time. Can I meet that 30 minute or 60 minute requirement for play with, with recess? Does that count? What about PE? I mean, no. <laughs> so when you, when you look here though, but we know for preschool for all, that's not a question I have to answer in this room. We know that we need kids to play. That's not news to you. What, what we do maybe need to talk a little bit more about is how the different types of play propel language and literacy development. So for example, dramatic play, that one stands out as a common like go-to, right? We know that in dramatic play, kids are using a lot of oral language, they're building some stories, they're constructing those narratives, they're drawing on their own experiences. We can, we can foster content, right? When you see the dramatic play up there, you see that they were learning about farms and that experience. They built their own farm. That's a commonality for us. But have we ever thought about how we're bringing emergent writing into dramatic play? What does that look like? Are there sticky notes there for their, them to draw their story out before they perform it? When we look at block and constructive play, you'll notice a little card um, down by that child's elbow. How are we bringing literacy and language in there? Architects build a plan. Do we have them jot that down? Do we have them share their plan for what they're going to build with a partner before they build it? To build that oracy component? You'll notice he has a vocabulary card next to him. Um, it, we had um, building parts with photographs and vocab words so they knew which parts of the building they were using at that time. Process art and messy play. I bet you didn't know this. Getting really messy highlights a part of our brain that can't be highlighted in any other way. And it is one of the most rich areas for conversation. It is one of the first places kids can learn to use scientific words. Mixture, slimy. Next, I hypothesize that because they're mixing paint. They're using all kinds of different materials. And we also know that for children that are multilingual learners, that process art and messy play is where their effective filter tends to be the lowest because it's an artistic experience. Rough and tumble play. I know you're all going, come on. <laughs> right? Because your first reaction is, we go down the slide, not up. What are you doing? I told you we don't run on the blacktop. Why? I mean, I know the whys. You can tell me, right? Like, I don't want parents mad at me. I don't want a lawsuit. I get that. Um, but let's back that up. Do you know that kids who 
experienced rough and tumble play on a regular basis have the highest resilience and the most ability to, to um, combat productive struggle in academic tasks. Because I skinned my knee and I survived. I hit this hard word and I can still read. And so that resiliency that comes from rough and tumble play carries over into the academic space of reading and writing where stuff feels really, really hard. But that's all right, I got this. It's okay if I fail, I just have to try again. My snow pile fell down, it's all right, I'm just gonna build it again. So that is where that intersects with that language and literacy. Also, coming inside and discussing rough and tumble play is an oracy builder because kids are really excited about it. Academic play, what I'd like you to do real quick, real quick, is take the sticky notes in front of you. There's some at your table, they say Starnet on them um, because they were free. <laughs> um, and so what you're going to do is you're going to put your name, um, and because Starnet's pretty great, but mostly because they were free. So you're going to take those and you're going to write your name like this, one letter on each sticky note. All right? One letter on each sticky note, write your name as fast as you can do this. As fast as humanly possible. If you need a nickname, that's okay. <laughs> if you need to give yourself a nickname so you don't have to make 20 sticky notes, you do that. Nobody's judging you. And I want you to make a little bit of space in front of you so you have room to spread it out. And the first thing I want you to do is just put it in your name order. If I was four, I'd have a name chart in front of me, but you guys got this. <laughs> You're like, I don't know, it's, it's still morning. <laughs> All right, so now that you have these in front of you, I want you to point to each sound and make, the make it out loud. Now I want you to mix up your name and make it again. Okay, then I want you to pull each sound down. All right, physically pull your letter down with each sound. You're pulling letters. Now see if you can mix it and fix it in 10 seconds. Go, mix it. And fix it. 10, 9, 8, don't feel pressure, 7, 6. Five, four, three, two, one. Now I want you to work with a partner to see if you can make a word with both of your names. <laughs> work with a partner. Can you make...
Okay, so you just experienced academic play. The Illinois Literacy Framework says we need to address foundational skills through intentional, specific instruction. Was this specific and intentional? Okay. It says we need to teach phonological awareness in multisensory ways. Did you just do that? 100%. Did you have opportunities to connect through oracy development with a partner? Did you experience inquiry? Yes. And you did that in two minutes. So academic play brings us to spaces where we function at a highest zone of proximal development. You were over here making big words with your names. I started with your name because why when I'm four and I'm egocentrical, it matters. And if you look up name puzzles, you're going to see a million other things that you can do. You can cut this so that they are self-correcting, right, as a scaffold. But this is just one example of academic play. I can use sand trays and shaving cream unless DCFS tells me no. Um, I, so I don't know. Um, I can, right, I can um, jump the word to practice segmenting and blending making human words, all right? So there's a million ways you can do academic play, but I wanted you to experience that today because I looked around this room and there wasn't one single person with their hood over their head. I mean, good news, hopefully you wouldn't do that anyway, that's rude. <laughs> but, right, I didn't see heads on the table and when I'm in a classroom, the same thing happens. When I put a worksheet in front of a child and I say, we got foundational skills to learn, let's do this, I got tears. But I don't need them. Play can do that for me. Discovery and loose parts. People always say, what are you saving all those toilet paper rolls for? What are you doing? Discovery and loose parts, um, when every time you do let kids explore how to do a science, pro a mini science project on their own, they have to investigate, they have to build resilience, and they have to talk to each other. Every time I throw a bucket full of different lids on a table, those can become sounds in a phonological awareness activity. Every time a child sorts different tools, parts, washers, nuts, bolts. Do you know what they're doing? They're learning to decode. Did you know that? Loose parts is the first place that decoding happens. Okay, so I just want us to think about how we add those things. Also in discovery and loose parts is a great place to stem emergent writing. What are you finding? What are you building? What are you making? What are you thinking? So I always have journals in loose parts and discovery. Wonder is one of the most powerful tools in your classroom. If you're leading instead of them, you're losing. When you're following their lead, we know that it creates the ability for me to figure out what do I wonder about means what do I want to read about. And then I put books out and I let kids explore them and you say, but they're not at their level. That's all right, I'm going to read the pictures and I'm going to push myself because when I want to read something that interests me, amazingly, I can read things a lot differently. Okay, so what we need to think about in specific nurturing language and content is this. A content-based provocation, collaboration structures, oracy prompts and scaffolds. So part of the literacy framework that you're going to see says, Contextualize. Say that with me. Contextualize. Say it again really loud. Contextualize. All right. When we do interdisciplinary literacy, we are contextualizing literacy skills. We are giving students a reason to want to read about stuff. If I just slap a text in front of you, but I don't have a reason to want to read it, that's how we get kids who don't like to read. That's why I'm an adult that prefers to look at magazines instead of books. 
You know why I read? Because I need to read to do my job. That's true. I wasn't a good reader. And you know what? Nobody told me that because I love dolphins, I can read about them. And nobody told me that there's other kinds of literacy, like maybe I can look at this time lapse video and then read about it. So if we want to create emphasis on reading, we need to tie it to something that kids like to do. That's why themes of study are a thing. Yes, you need explicit foundational skills practice, and sometimes that's not going to be thematically en enhanced. Sometimes that's going to be like we got to do this 20-minute lesson. But that also means we're going to tie it in throughout our day through a content-based provocation. So what you see in front of you are houses that kids built out of um, paper bags and other supplies from the art center. The unit that we were doing at this time was the building and construction unit from Creative Curriculum. And it doesn't have to be Creative Curriculum. I don't care what curriculum you use. But that's what we were doing. <laughs> and um, the content-based provocation was I put a bunch of crap out. And I said, build your neighborhood. Right? You know what the thing is? I didn't cut anything ahead of time. They did that cutting because that's not my job. So I set all that stuff out. I said, build me a neighborhood. And then we read books about all kinds of neighborhoods, fiction and nonfiction books about neighborhoods. And then kids talked about it. And they talked about it a lot. And then I gave them prompts about neighborhoods. And then I scaffolded those prompts so that multilingual learners could participate. And then at my small group table, we did phonological awareness activities just like you did with your name with words about neighborhoods. Why? So it was, what was that C word we used? Contextualized. And sometimes we're going to have to scaffold that because we're not all in the same place at the same time. So if you take a look up here, you'll see from that construction unit, what can you build? Those are photographs of buildings from the different countries that represented the children in my classroom. They're different homes around the world. And then you see that note, see, think, try. This was a preschool classroom. So what they know is I'm going to take a look at the provocation. I'm going to think about what I'm going to do. I share that with a friend, and then I try to make it. See, think, try. Over in the blocks, you see a, a, a plan there. Plan, share, build. Where's the oracy there? Plan and share. They're planning on a piece of paper through emergent drawing and writing. They're sharing with a partner. I decided to. I know I will. And then they're building it. And then they have reflective statements that they can move into. Oracy, oracy, oracy. Emergent writing. Dramatic play. They're creating their story. Plan, practice, perform. I wonder, do you think, I'm planning, I still need to. You're holding space to use the provocation, but letting kids negotiate their meaning independently. And again, we're going to go back to the science of reading, where we need to think about meaning making. We need to think about vocabulary development. We need to think about fluency. Oracy builds fluency. Okay. I don't know what's going to happen with that video. Maybe nothing. OK. Um, when we look here, you might be thinking, what is this mess? This mess is emergent writing. When you look at that wall and you see, look what I made, that's where emergent writing starts. Kids make stuff they care about, and then they write about it, and they tell you about it, and you document it. And then pretty soon it starts turning into writing. The loose parts that you see, those are phonological awareness tools. Do you know that with a piece of yarn, I can take a word and go like this? Um, let's see. Literacy. Wrap it up. Literacy. Do you know that I can spring, string beads to make my sounds? And I can wear that word all day long. It's like Taylor Swift, friendship bracelets. Um, this is just an example of what an environment might look like where kids are in that discovery and loose part space. You see a table there. Um, that's, and you see like a checklist. 
if they're, re they're using that checklist to document their experiences. We talked about contextualized. This is contextualization around the tree study. Um, you see foundational skills there with sight words. You, um, in the tree poem, that contextualized right, I read, trees are fun. That was a, a preschool writing at the end of the semester. But before they wrote about trees, how do they know trees are fun? Well, look, they're out there touching them. That's how they know. Um, we read um, a tree named Steve. If you haven't read it, I'm crying, you're crying, we're all crying. Um, if you have, <laughs> just so you know, um, it's a great story. But it ties in the SEL piece. It also ties in the content connection. And what I really like about this book is it's a really special one to retell because it taps on the emotional part of my brain, which makes retelling easier, right? Because it makes an emotional connection for me. And then you see the process art above, and you see some of their writing because they had to draw and label. It's all fun and games till somebody has to label, right? <laughs> so that's that, um, growing trees. And then you see those observations, what I saw, what I felt, what I know. Um, none of these anchor charts are made ahead. Why? Because we need to make them together so that I can model how I'm making them. What are the kids doing? What is the teacher doing? So hopefully, when kids are building, I love tree cookies. They have tree cookies over there, right? So great. I love it. Oh, that's your school. Oh, it is your school. High five me. <laughs> um, so um, <laughs> that's so funny. Yes, it is your school. So you see them building with tree cookies. Um, when they're doing that, what are you doing? Are you starting a play invitation? Are you doing an assessment? Are you just watching and taking note of what needs to happen next? What if I put letters on those tree cookies? Could I do that? You notice a teacher right there on the ground with the child. And what you can't see, can't hear, right, is that they're having a conversation about what's happening with tractors. And what, what you don't know is that when they leave the tractors, they're going to write a story on a flip chart with pictures and labels. You see this teacher is assessing actually in math, but again, assessing right where? In the play. I don't see anybody pulling kids to a table while everybody else runs amok. That's not happening. All right. And ready, set, go, Antoinette. <laughs> so we talked about Teach Plus a little bit earlier, and we're just going to come back to this, because sometimes when we talk about play, even amongst our own colleagues, it's like, the, the Disney show Recess. I'm dating myself a little bit, but if you remember the, Dis like one Saturday morning, it was one of the shows that used to come on, and it was, um, the name of the show was Recess. And in that show, this was really them talking about the kindergartners. Before they would go out for recess, they would literally, the, the children in first grade would have like all of these PowerPoints about being careful of the kindergartners. And their image of the kindergartners just had them like running amok. You know, they would be, they had war paint on, right? Because that's kind of the idea that we have when it comes to play. Play is serious business. How do we know? Have you ever played a game of Scrabble with someone? while you were waiting for the pizza to come. Some of us know what bid whist is. <laughs> Ever played that game? I mean, I've seen some Christian folks like almost have to go and repent because it gets real serious, right? It was a game. Why do we need a thesaurus? Pull I'm challenging that word. We're playing a game. It's serious business. It takes a lot of work. This is what Teach Plus pulled out of the research that they did. It's anchored to what? The standards. It is small group. It is whole group. It's one-on-one. -on -one. Students can initiate, but that does not mean as an educator, and this is what we want to get that point across to our teachers, to our school boards, 
to our superintendents that are like not understand, well, if they're playing, how are they gonna be ready for third grade? Um, first of all, that is part of the early childhood spectrum, birth to grade age eight, right? So they're gonna be ready because it's developmentally appropriate. But the teacher is not just giving up the classroom to the children. It is their classroom. We are co-collaborators, really and truly, but it's built on those standards. So now what does that mean? Da -da -da -da. MTSS, okay? And when we say snippet about MTSS, this is gonna really be a snip snippet. How does that equitable literacy in MTSS and you come in? Because of Every Student Succeeds Act. Under No Child Left Behind, we thought of this as response to intervention. It was very deficit-based in our mindset because response to intervention literally meant the child is not doing well, we're going to intervene. What was their response? The letter of the law made it a deficit-based model, but the intent of the law was always that we would have a framework in place that allowed us to precursor having a system so that if children struggle, we know what we're going to do. We learned from using response to intervention when Every Student Succeeds Act was being created, and it morphed, or I like to say RTI grew up into what we call multi-tiered system of support. This is what it looks like under ESSA, and I'll step out of the way for so folks can really look at it. It's a flexible model that really shifts us from that deficit-based thinking to asset-based thinking. Look what we get to do through MTSS. Well, why are we talking about that in the literacy? Because our state literacy plan explicitly talks about using MTSS as a framework while we're talking about comprehensive literacy. Problem is, we're not just teaching literacy. We also have math, and when you're in early childhood, sometimes you're the art teacher, you're the computer teacher, you're the music teacher, you're the social worker, you're the nurse, you're the everything, right? So through a tiered system of supports, you know how to build everything into the foundation of what you're doing universally. Look at that equitable, right? When we're talking about equitable learning, we've got to talk about our multilingual learners. We have to talk about our students receiving special education. Not every student is struggling. Is there anyone in here that has a four-year-old that's going on 14? <laughs> right? Raise your hand. Quite literally, right? So today is Monday. You're not there. You know who he or she is. I like to call them Little Miss or Mr. U.S. News and World Report, right? When you get back tomorrow, they're going to literally say to you, Miss Chelsea, when do you want me to debrief about yesterday, <laughs> right? That is the child that's gonna tell you who ran when they were supposed to walk, right? Who forgot their lunch? Somebody didn't take their nap when they were supposed to. And then they're gonna ask you, and how was the conference, right? So our children that are high flyers, they need us as well. That deficit-based model, we were so focused on the children giving us challenging behavior, the student like, well, we taught the letter A, they didn't get it by Tuesday, they must need an IEP, right? <laughs> no, it's a full framework of holistic teaching. I love that under ESSA, we're really talking about aligning our practices from general education to special education, supports, mental health, behavioral health. Note here, they're not talking about challenging behavior. They're talking about behavior from an aspect of health and well-being. And then I love that this, through ESSA, it lets us know it's ongoing. Hey, Dr. Taylor, can you come in? We're really struggling with our MTSS. Well, have you done any professional development about it? Yes, when did you do it? 2015 when ESSA came out. Uh, you <laughs> wrong answer, ongoing. We're a mobile society. We have new teachers graduating every year coming into our programs. You have people coming into your district that are new every year. How do you do business? That's that ongoing professional learning. And this is what we get when we're able to create a tiered system rather than trying to do literacy over here. Remember when Eckers 3 came out, everyone, and math literacy was the big thing? 
And when those first Eckers three reports came out and math literacy was like, what's happening? Our children aren't even going to be able to know two plus two. And everywhere you went, Erickson, ECPL, start early. Everybody was doing math literacy professional development. Well, now we're talking about literacy. Well, am I going to do math literacy? I'm going to do language literacy. Well, what about STEM, STEAM, STREAM, right? We don't have to choose when it comes to MTSS because we're synthesizing all those evidence-based practices and this is what we get. This is where the equity piece comes in. We have students, as I said before, who are multilingual learner, talented and gifted, twice exceptional, children with 504 plans, children with IEPs, children who are in care. Right? Children who have family members. Uh, we were in a session just earlier, I did a round table, and there was a, um, a, one of our colleagues and she was saying, I'm dealing with a parent that's 81. What does that mean? That's great grandma, big mama, abuela, who's a parent again, probably twice. An 81 year old parent that is raising a three or four or five year old, and she literally said, that grandparent was like, hey, in my day, you were seen in what? Okay, that's that question mark. We've got to have these equitable systems in place for all of our children. So this is the purpose of MTSS. We shift ourselves from that deficit-based model, which by the way, if you have, and most of our children are average, as are we, right? You don't miss any of your children because you're looking at the unique needs and abilities of all of our children. Those middle of the road children, those are the ones when it comes to your TSG or your DRDP checkpoint, <laughs> it's like, oh, we don't have anything. Uh, what's her name again? You know the one, her hair is always so cute. She has those, we almost cannot even remember her name, or right? Because we're so focused on that student that's giving us that challenging behavior. The whole child, we're looking at the unique needs and the abilities of all of our children. And we're looking at the continuum. Scaffolding, that's a continuum. Differentiated instruction, <clears throat> that's a continuum. Universal design for learning, UBD, all a part of the continuum. So what we love about ESSA is that it literally explained evidence-based to us. So for those of us that have been hearing EBPs, it's not just that new buzzword under Every Student Succeeds Act. This is the language that we're given. We shifted from evident, um, talking about scientific research base, which was never defined, to evidence-based. Look at that shift in thinking, sustaining student outcomes improving student achievement. And then, what I love about the law is that they actually defined it. So when Lindsay was talking about the science of, liter of reading, well, how come the literacy plan doesn't say science of reading? Because the literacy plan says this, because that's the federal education law of the land. And it's been very, made very, very clear to all states that the federal law of the land, whether it's COVID, a measles uh, epidemic, whatever it is, the federal law of the land is still the federal law of the land. So the literacy S, um, plan literally has this like cut and paste right in that plan. And as well it should because it defines evidence-based practices for us. So what are we doing about that in Illinois? In Illinois, quite simply, as we shifted from RTI to MTSS, Illinois is one of the few states that has a pre-K through grade 12 MTSS infrastructure, always has, even when it was response to intervention. Early Childhood Professional Learning, our host for this conference, uh, their grant deliverables includes MTSS to make sure, again, we talked about that framework of birth to age eight, so early childhood all goes all the way up to third grade to make sure that there's connection between what's happening K-12, a lot of joint meetings, a lot of definitions that are the same. This is a holistic definition for MTSS that is used across the state. It's on your handout. You can take a picture of that if you'd like. Actually, the Illinois MTSS Network created that definition, but Cindy Berry is the project director of ECPL. Um, when she found out that was the definition they were using, it was adopted immediately for Early Childhood MTSS Consortium. So what's this national snippet? Division for Early Childhood. 
as we morphed into Every Student Succeeds Act, the earlier paper on response to intervention, that was a joint effort between DEC, National Head Start Association, and NAEYC. DEC looked at that paper and said, you know what, we've got to let it evolve because ESSA has evolved. They rewrote the paper. I, I was blessed to be a planner and a writer on this paper, revised the paper, Really, we're excited that the paper specifically says early care and education. We want all of our colleagues to know this is not just about if you're in a school district. NAEYC defines early childhood as birth to age eight, and they explicitly say publicly funded, privately funded, tuition-based. If that's your age range, home-based, homeschooling, you're part of early childhood. The, the DEC paper uh, emphasizes that bust up that triangle a little bit, talk about the myths and misconceptions, and here's the federal snippet that I really wanted to get to. So in July of 2022, which I might add is after the DEC paper came out in 2021, the Department of Ed came out with this positive, proactive approaches to supporting children with disabilities and a guide for stakeholders. I was actually um, doing a little, um, snippet in DC when this came out. We were so excited. Of course, DEC, we were saying, you know they copy them because most of the stuff that's in our favor is what, you know, they just borrowed from us. We were happy to let them lend some of our language, but look at what they said. There's that evidence-based word again. Equitable, because it's culturally and linguistically. Responsive. So you build your tiered support, making sure that it's culturally appropriate, linguistically appropriate, and it's twice exceptional appropriate. It's all of those things. And it's a comprehensive, preventive framework. And look how they expanded it. It is social emotional. Remember that definition from Teach Plus? It's built on the learning standards. In Illinois, we have social emotional learning standards. So we're not guessing what do our children need when they are under duress and it presents itself as challenging behavior. We can look at the behavior and then go to the social emotional standards and then say, this is the skill the child is telling me they need me to teach them. This is the knowledge that they are needing from me, just like I would with language arts or math or social studies science, any place else. It's evidence-based strategies and supports, and there is that four-letter word, data. Whoa, right? We don't like data. Often it's because how it's used sometimes against us. We got our Eckers 3 summary report. We're not all sevens. How are we going to get gold? Boom, 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 right? Browbeat teachers over the head, of course they don't like data. They don't want to look at it because it usually means something that's negative to them. Data is our friend. Some people use the phrase, the devil is in the details. Uh, thank you, Marilyn Monroe, the diamond is in the rough, <laughs> right? They're this girl's best friend at least. The data helps us have decisions and make decisions about our children. Why did we form that small group the way that we did? Did we form that small group in August and have the same small group in May? If we do, we're not listening to the data. Well, what data? Your screening data, your TSG, your DRDP, um, early learning scale, whatever you might be using. And Antoinette, where's the most viable place to gather that data? When children are doing their naturalistic tendency of what? Play. That's why it's child initiated and teacher as well. So when they're having that, but it's supposed to be an uninterrupted 60 minutes because the Eckers three people said that. Yes, they did, but they didn't say that they're over here and I'm over here like, I'm gonna try to get this checkpoint in real quick because I know it's due, right? And we're behind, right? I have 10 kids that have been absent. I need to get that data in. I'm engaging with them. That picture that Dr. Meeker showed of that teacher that 
is down to the level of the child. And we're really asking serious questions like, oh, I see you use blue. Why do you like blue? Blue's my favorite color as well. No, we want to ask some real serious questions. Oh, what are you building? What made you decide to build that? And they get into a whole conversation. And it is their conversation. And so we have to be in tune because at some point the child's going to be like, I'm done talking to you. I'm trying to hurry up because a few minutes, I know we have to go to lunch. When they turn, guess what you do? We ease ourselves right on now because there's another child back there. Right? And so when it comes to me collecting my assessment data, I'm settling up next to the child when they are in play. And I am not only trying to figure out what I see, what I hear, but wait a minute, I thought I would see this. I thought I would hear that. Why did I think that? Because I know we've been teaching it. And I know we've been talking about it. But I didn't hear it. I didn't hear it, I didn't see it. So when I do my next small groups, who are my little kiddos that are gonna be with me in that group? Because my data has informed me that they need, they've got the universal, but I'm gonna do a little bit more targeted support for those children. So they're gonna be in my, sm my small group. MTSS provides a valuable framework for dealing with what? long-standing inequities. Some of those inequities are how we've been um, collaborating or not collaborating with our community-based partners, with our home-based partners. Some of those inequities have to do with the suspension and expulsion of children, mostly children of color. Long-standing inequities of understanding and working with children who are multilingual learners. On your tables, you should all have this handout. As I said before, within the grant deliverables of ECPL, uh, they hold the grant deliverable for MTSS <coughs> in the state. On the back of this, if you scan that QR code, it takes you directly to the site. And when that site, their MTSS site was built out, it built in the resources for multilingual learners special populations. Built in there are resources for the National Center for PMI, um, National Center for Pyramid Model Innovations, CASEL. Well, what does all of that have to do with literacy? Because it's a part of how we get the standards across. It's a part of how we build relationships with children. The standards are right within there. We cannot do this work without the standards. And when we think about the comp oh go ahead. Mm, go. <laughs> when we think about the comprehensive literacy plan, yes, MTS is a part of that, but let's let's for a second just look at this literacy plan. Where do we see language and DAP highlighted and how does it align to Illinois early learning standards? So I did that looking for you because again, 60 minutes. Um, and but you if, do have a handout but you that have, you can take with you some components of the plan in front of you on a handout. You, it's also very easy to navigate on the website. I'm gonna pull this up here. This is what I want you to understand is that when this was developed, it was developed with early learners in mind. So there's a toolkit out, I think. Mm -hmm. I don't need that one. The toolkit came out um, the 16th yep. of this month. There's a First thing we want to tell you all is <laughs> it's a lot. A rubric is going to come out by June 30th. What we're trying to do now is because so many people have been talking about the comprehensive literacy plan, and it includes pre-K and multilingual learners, and now that's another thing that we have to do. We want to try to get in front of that from the early childhood side and talk to you all a little bit about it, and then actually we're going to do a, a breakout within the room so you can see just how closely aligned it is to what you are already and what your teachers should already be doing. The toolkit, it's just that. It's got the executive summary in there. The full document itself is like 190 something page. Lindsay and I have read it a million times, but on your spare time, when you're getting your nails done or getting your tea or whatever, getting your hair done, you might wanna read it. It's a lot, that's okay. We're, 
what the work that we're doing is breaking it down for you. So I'm going to show you this. Um, where I, maybe we'll let you take it down. I might show you. Nothing like fumbling here. Okay. Oh, guess mo. Perfect. Um, so when you look at the Illinois Literacy Framework, you're going to see that each kind of skill section has young learners identified, okay? And specifically calls out components that we see every single day in both child-led and teacher-led play experiences. So I'm going to this is all important, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kind of scroll down a little bit. You'll see that MTSS piece, don't get dizzy, all right, I'm too far. Okay, well then, we just won't do that right now. But what I, what I would like you to do, because it'll waste your time, but if you can pull it up on your own device, great. If not, um, the Illinois Literacy Framework, what we know is this. Under each section, there are intentional nods to play. So for example, oral language, page 26, when we look at the young learner, it says we need integration, playful learning, and it needs to be interactive. Play centers, literacy centers, gamified small groups, phonological awareness, it specifically calls out phonemic play, familiar words, cultural connections. Where do we see that happen? Play centers. Word recognition, it specifically calls out environmental print, contextualized learning, authentic writing. We see that in centers, interest areas, whatever you call them. Um, Fluency, it says it needs to include playful extension. It says it must include creative storytelling. Where does that happen? Where do you see that in your classrooms? Dramatic play, right? The blocks and building. And if you, can, if you can let go for a minute and put your blocks and building next to your dramatic play, magic is going to happen and you're going to have a mess and it's going to be okay. Um, vocabulary, interaction, visuals, read alouds, props. Again, where do we see that play centers? So I just wanted to call that out for you as you get into it so that you can see where those exact alignments happen to play in language and literacy. So what we want you to do now is look at the handout that you have. Oh, okay. Do we need more? Yes. It's a handout that looks like this. It's just the executive summary of the literacy plan. Thank you. I'm going to see if we can get back into the PowerPoint. Oh, I know where that is. And what we want you to do, if you've got, I'll handle them. You can easily pull up your phone, or you're familiar with the IELDS. Everybody get one, it looks like this. And on the back side of that is, is also a brief snippet of that Teach Plus, uh, the research they did. It is kind of play-based learning in kindergarten, but what we have found is that as we've been kind of taking the show on the road, we've had so many preschool for all, preschool for all expansion teachers come up to us and say, that's the best definition of play I've ever heard. I mean, I know we've always talked about play-based learning in early childhood, but I, I almost didn't know what I was doing. That definition that Teach Plus gave, it literally helps us define what we need to do and how we need to do it. So don't let that kindergarten fool you. It really is a good definition for early childhood. I would say across learning. the entire spectrum. Yes. So we want you to look at the part of the literacy plan those seven components of literacy. Think about the Illinois Early Learning and Development Center. Think about the Illinois Early 
early learning and development standards when it comes to language and literacy. Think of those components and try to do a crosswalk between an IELDS benchmark standard or goal to one of those components. So we're going to take the next two minutes and ask you to do that. This is a scavenger hunt. We're calling it the Comprehensive Literacy Plan Scavenger Hunt. You can vote the IELDS on your phone. You can also think of if you cross walk DRDP or my teaching strategies or early learning scale to the IELDS. And just real quick, look at those components from the literacy plan. Think of the standards and think of a place where, oh, this matches this. We just want you to see where, like, really, if you've been using contextualized, play-based, developmentally appropriate practice and leaning into literacy, you're going to feel connected to what you see, we, we think. So take a moment. We're going to do two minutes.
understand is going to become a part of the foundation of what you're already doing. It's just like if you own a home. Sometimes you have to do some remodeling. Sometimes, like, why is this water coming in the basement? You don't need to tear the whole home down, right? You might just need to look at what's happening in the foundation and shore it up there. Because, and not only does the literacy plan say MTSS, the law that created the plan explicitly states MTSS. So we want you to be able to see this and understand it through um, this model so that as you're looking at MTSS, especially for your districts that are like, well, it's always been our model about are kids going to get into special education or not? The ESSA is not going to allow us to do that, and certainly this plan is not, because it, we literally have got to be able to use MTSS. And the easiest way to do that is for you to tap into your teachers, literally going in the door saying, see, we've already been doing this through our curriculum and through the standards. Y'all, our time is up. Y'all listen real good. You engage real good. <laughs> Enjoy the rest of the content. If you walk away with anything else, it's that we know we can build language and literacy in play. We just need to make those in play invitations and the way we build the game with children intentional and aligned. Thank you. <laughs> Enjoy.